The Dick Cavett Show. Tonight with special guest, Woody Allen. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Cavett. You're lovelier than I remembered you. <laughs> have, I, have we met before? The audience looks familiar. The strange sensation. Say, I have to explain something about this show, and I'll try to explain it very quickly. Uh, this show uh, is being seen at home uh, after one... Uh, that, this is out of sequence. That's the phrase I'm looking for. In other words, this show is seen after a show that I'm going to tape later today, one that I haven't taped yet. So when you are seeing this show now, you've already seen a show that I did earlier, in which I may have referred to this show, even though I hadn't done it. So, Woody Allen was nice enough to interrupt a vacation that he hasn't taken yet uh, in order to be here. So, I just wanted to clear that up. Does everyone have that? Because you'll be quizzed on this later. Um, this will also necessitate your laughing before jokes are told in order to put the time back together. Are we all set now? Uh, it's a funny feeling. I don't want to waste any time out here because there's so much to Woody Allen that you might not suspect because I know every intimate side of him. And... Uh, as if, it was funny, years ago, I used to write introductions, or intros, as we call them, for Woody, when he would appear on shows that I was writing for, the old Tonight shows and other shows that I was writing for. I would have to write a funny line for the star, for Woody. I remember once I wrote one, I introduced him as, uh, by saying that once again, he did not make the best dressed list. Uh, he was edged out by the rest of the country. <laughs> and uh, this went very nicely. The, he also, one line was that he spent a fortune trying to quell the rumors that he was the illegitimate son of Groucho and Alice B. Toklas, which uh, was mildly popular. And uh, the one my favorite, I guess, was that he's the only man I know whose sister was named in a paternity suit. But um, this doesn't make any sense, you see. It's, it's, just a, it's a weird sort of thing. And in spite of these wretched jokes, he still speaks to me and will after this message. So stay with us and we'll be right back. The question is, when do we see the show uh, that we're doing now, right now? <laughs> I thought I explained that. Ah, uh, my next guest, to put it uh, frankly and simply, is a, is a writer, a director, uh, a very skillful amateur musician, a philosopher, a comedian, a friend, a folk hero, a college dropout, and a prominent and successful one. Will you welcome, please, Mr. Woody Allen. Your thing? own flower. Yes, I got yes. a plastic flower. <laughs> I'm allergic to. Uh, dear Woody, you tried to get away from us, but we finally are seeing you again. Remember the flowers on the premiere show? Well, here they come again. Hope is just uh, something about a hmm. pregnancy? <laughs> I dem <clears throat> Thank you. I'm really flattered. I'm going to hold this. Oh, pardon me? Oh, you're down there. I'm looking up and... Oh, oh it's two girls? <laughs> That's right. I remember you. <laughs> it's nice to see you again. That's right. These huh. girls have followed my career through its uh, cataclysmic climb and have, have <laughs> given really me all sorts of good you things. You go way back with them? This is yeah. real nice, this little plastic flower. The price tag's still on it, however. It says, it's true, it says 10 cents on the, on the flower, which is nice, because the money's not important. The thought, <laughs> next time I'd like a Buick. <laughs> I'm going to sit now. Can I interest you in a chair? Uh, oh, 
You've broken your flower. Yeah, I know. It's, it's, I've deflowered the girl's flower. That's exactly what you did. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hold on to this and fondle it during the show to keep me from getting uh, too excited. Is this, is this typical? Uh, uh... <laughs> <laughs> I have a bruise that's going to show up through the next two uh, telethons I'm on. All right, well, keep your pants on. Oh, that hurt. But uh, you, you say, is that a typical thing? I mean, to have people following you like that? I suppose with the movie playing everywhere of yours and all, you have people mobbing you on the streets and at the stage doors. And uh, more, I'm, I'm known more now than I was, yeah. but I'm not recognized as much, which is... <laughs> I, I know that sounds paradoxical, but um, like I'll go someplace and people... I was at Bloomingdale's buying some things and um, the woman waited on me and she made a big fuss over me and said, oh, I see you on television. Then when I leave, uh, she said to me, um, it was nice serving you, Mr. Herman. And what happens is, this is true, people call me Mr. Herman because of Woody Herman, oh, the, yeah, uh, the yeah. uh, clarinet player and the, um, the musician. And um, they frequently say Mr. Herman, and occasionally, it's really humiliating when they'll say to me, it was nice serving you Mr. Woodpecker. <laughs> <laughs> you, there's no way you can get out of that. I mean, you have to just pretend you are that person or that yeah, bird or whatever. Yes, I just take it easy and, and I... not to embarrass them about it. What did you have for breakfast? Today? Yeah, this is going to be a, a deep probing interview, and I want to know what exactly you had for breakfast. Uh, a large OJ, which I made myself, an orange juice, eight ounces. Uh, yeah. Uh, some uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, a Theragran multivitamin, um, some roast pork fuyang on a bed of lettuce, um, and I had some really? white bread that I soak in warm water all the time because I like it. It's easier to chew. And, um, <laughs> I had an English muffin ladled with honey and myrrh on it, and, um, I, it's and I had some hot mouth. cocoa oh. and some rum, and you baste it uh, on the edges, and then I had some more Italian food and some linguine, and uh, yes, to get the day off to a nice light start. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, did they carry you here uh, as a result of this? Or? You know, I know. I really know that you are concerned about your diet and all. I, mean, I'm a I remember you once addict. bought a book on uh, on cholesterol. Uh, we were wandering on, uh, on an avenue in Hollywood once, and bought a, a book on cholesterol. Do you do you count your cholesterol? Do you worry about the pork foo young? Uh, I do. I worry about uh, dying uh, from something, from anything. But cholesterol, I would not like yeah. to die. I don't want to die uh, from a heart attack. You know what I mean? Yeah. I will accept any other kind of death, <laughs> but uh, I don't want to keel over in mid-sentence, you know, or, or, mm -hmm. or die as I'm speaking to you now, for instance, you know. I, I don't yeah. like to die on a late-night show. I you know, it's die in prime time if I can. I, <laughs> I, I used to think of the, uh, during a comedy act on stage in a nightclub where mm -hmm. you do die in the other sense often, uh, that would be the, probably the most ludicrous way to go. To keel over face forward with your head hitting the footlights. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't want that to happen. I don't want a heart attack. And uh, so I try and eat without cholesterol if I possibly can. I eat uh, unsaturated fats and uh, glucose and lactose and, um, you know, I eat stuff like that. And I, I remain slim and thin. Do you find if somebody has a cold around you, it drives you nuts, uh, you, you avoid them? And, yes, I think yeah. they're weak if they have a cold around me. Yeah. Because I, like yeah, I do, because I don't, you know, I don't like <clears throat> to, um, I, I don't think I can take disease. I'm not one, you know, I don't like to be sneezed on by people. I once did an entire interview with Marlo Thomas, who had a cold on the show, and I, I, held, I had some notes, and I held them like this throughout the entire interview, and to this day, she doesn't know what I look like. It's a curious, <laughs> curious right. thing. You don't say, want... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, that's all right. It, 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 I had nothing to say. I realized that I don't know... But I didn't either. Uh -huh. so I, I realized that I didn't know exactly what your marital status is at the moment, even though I know you. Are you officially single now or semi-officially single? I'm or? single. Yeah. Uh, in the sense of not being married, uh, if you know what I mean. Uh, mm. I can do anything I like to anyone I like. <laughs> oh. uh, with their consent. Ah, uh, well, it's a long show and... Uh, <laughs> But I'm, yes, I was I'm single. I was thinking sometime you ought to really write a serious book on uh, women and, and marriage because you've been through how many two? I was married two times. Two full times. Uh, once and then once again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> do you ever? Uh, do, do you think when you've been married twice, 
that you caught on to the first marriage, what would make a second marriage work? Do you know what I mean? And then is it a shock when you find that the thing you thought you learned from the first marriage doesn't work in the second marriage? Right, because you apply everything that you learned in the first marriage to the second girl. And that's a problem because the second girl is nothing like the first girl if you're lucky. And um, that's exactly what I did. I, I made a certain amount of mistakes in my first marriage, like showing up, you know. Um, and because of it, um, I, I tried to learn from those mistakes and gain a certain wisdom. And in my second marriage, I applied these little nuances and tricks and little, little moves and things that I was able to, to accumulate over the years. And, and um, that marriage lasted shorter than my first marriage. So there's just no way to know. Now, would you take a third one, a, a third uh, dive? Uh, From who? Third chance? No, would you take a, would you take a chance on a third marriage? Uh, 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 I you... would marry again, I think, uh, mm -hmm. if the opportunity presented itself in a way that enabled me to feel that there was a chance of it succeeding. Yeah. But is there this a is not a proposal, is it? No, 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 no. <laughs> it's a long show, however. <laughs> they, uh, the, is there a type that you look for? Do you have a certain s set of characteristics that you see? Ah, there goes Miss Wright. Uh, yeah, but, you know, you'll hate me if I say it. Um, yeah. I, I like pretty girls. You know, I'm old-fashioned that way. I, I like yeah. girls that are pretty and earthy-looking. You know, you know, almost... almost Broad. I'd rather she was overweight than underweight, and long hair, mm -hmm. and straggly, earth mother, sexual kind of animal, disgusting <laughs> types, you know? And, yes. and uh, th that's right, you, you know, you really see them there with the blouse and, and you know, dirty and everything, and, and, and I enjoy that and because the thought mm -hmm. of what you could do with them later is wonderful, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I like them to be intelligent and have a good sense of humor, to anticipate my needs and be um, aggressive without being masculine. I like a girl who will perform any act without any problem and a girl that doesn't like to cook and doesn't like to do home things and a girl, uh, her religious convictions don't matter whatsoever and um, just about uh, anybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> would, you ever, would you ever go on a blind date? Uh, I would not go on a blind date because uh, I used to go on blind dates yeah. and they were not successful for me for the most part. The trouble with a blind date is the anticipation of the girl that you're going to get on the date never comes out to be what you actually wind up with. I so you, you have wonderful thoughts of you'll open the door and this girl will be there and she'll be sensational. Then you meet her, you know, and she's like playing with a rubber tire hanging from a chain in the living room. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, and it's, it's depressing, and, and everybody goes through the same thing because you can't, uh, there's no way to beat that blind date thing because yeah. what you build up, when, when you hear you have a blind date and they say the girl's name is like Gloria or something. Oh, yes. I, I said Gloria at random because I don't know any Glorias. Yeah. And uh, you think you're going to get a real package of wonderfulness. They sound great over the phone and everything. Mm -hmm. And there's no way the girl can live up to it. Also, there's no way you can live up to her expectation. I have a dread of knocking on the door on a blind date and the girl opening the door and looking at me and her face falling, you know, and, you know, that look where she says, or when I was younger, where they used to look at me, and they'd say, oh, come in, you know, forcing a smile on their face, and I would sit down, and they would run back in their bedroom and take their heels off and put on flats. While oh, time, yes, you know? I used to get that. Sure, because oh, they used yeah. to tower over me on those. Um... Yeah. Oh, I hated that. Wait a minute, we, let's go into this deeper. We will return after this brief message of interest. talking with Woody Allen, and we were talking about the problems of... Uh, that thing really hits home with me, the girl going in and putting on flatter shoes. That, that used to happen all the time. Yeah, we're, we're approximately the same size, although I, I would think uh, I'm a little, probably a little taller than you are. Did you get that much as a kid? Did they, did they ever call you shorty? Um, they didn't call me shorty, but I was always kind of like first or second on line, you know, which is really a humiliating experience when you're a kid because you want to be, I don't know why you want to be taller. There's no advantage either. in being taller, but when they tell you that tall is good, and so it's, you know, it's better to be tall. Yeah, I don't know what that is, but it used to plague me. Are, are you in any kind of legal hassle now? The last time you were here, you had a couple of lawsuits going, and I wondered if they've yes, resolved. I, my, um, uh, I don't know if I can say this. I, my my ex-wife is suing me because I made a, um, an amusing remark about her. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she, um, she lives on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Mm -hmm. And she was coming home late at night and she was violated. That's how they put it in the New York paper, she was violated. And they asked me if I would comment on it. 
And I said, knowing my ex-wife, it probably was not a moving violation. <laughs> So she's suing me, you know. Well, I, I, I can't imagine why. I mean, the woman must have no sense of humor. But, yeah. Well, now she'll be suing me, so I wouldn't want to say that. But, but you know, it was, I, I just said it in a moment of gay abandon, yeah. you know. <laughs> and she sued me for a million dollars in a moment of enormous abandon. <laughs> if, you, if you were to meet on the street suddenly, would you be cordial, though, probably? Uh... Yes. I think if I ran into her on the street, we would stop and chat and exchange blunt instruments. <laughs> 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 I, uh, the, I, don't, I don't like to ask all guests the same questions, but I've, uh, there's one that I, I, I sort of wish I'd been asking people all along, and that is, can they remember when they first became aware of uh, the difference between the sexes, the birds and the bees, the, the phenomenon of... There's uh, a difference? <laughs> <laughs> oh, how embarrassing. I... I, mean, this, this I became again. aware real early. I was precocious. Can you remember? Yeah, yeah, I remember becoming aware that there was another sex that was softer than mine uh, mm -hmm. when I was in the crib. You know, when I was a tiny really? baby in the crib. Yeah, I remember. I remember those are girls, and I like them, and I want to be around them and touch them. And 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 boys are good, but they're not as good. They're better for delivering <laughs> messages and stuff. You know, and and <laughs> girls are good to eat with and stroke. And and um, I knew that right away. You know, in the crib. I've devoted my life to it. Were you not alone in the crib? Uh, uh, not if I could swing it. <laughs> I, I have I have very very early memories of of, a, of a feelings of erotic attraction. Very early. Uh, not the crib, but maybe year or year one or two. And uh, I always felt that that was probably bad, you know, and then I And then you later. feel guilty about it, right? Yeah. You know, because yeah. you, you had those, those erotic thoughts when... Of course, I was in the crib till quite a late age. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Where you met your second wife, isn't it? <laughs> it's really funny, because yeah. most people don't. Most people, there, there is a... a, a stage of latent sexuality where but but I don't think I ever had a stage yeah. of, of latent sexuality I think I was right in there swinging you know all the time trying hard mm -hmm. and and uh, <laughs> I remember asking my mother uh, you know how do you get babies and at the time she thought that I said rabies you know <laughs> and she said from a dog bite you know <laughs> which is some total of my sexual education oh, yeah. my that aunt had uh, <laughs> twins about two months later, and I thought she was attacked by a Great Dane, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, that is... I, you know, when I was reading about Freud later when I was in college, because I always worried about those feelings, and uh, it turned out that that's what shocked Vienna in the, in the late 19th century, was that uh, he dared to say that children had sexual thoughts. They could't believe this. This was outrageous. I, I guess uh, I guess it's accepted today. Maybe not. I maybe don't not. know. You know, people. I, I'm always shocked by the amount of, of prudery uh, over mm -hmm. sex. I was in, uh, coincidentally, you mentioned it, Vienna uh, uh, during the summer because bananas yeah. opened there recently, uh, and um, I visited Freud's house, which is really interesting. You know, and they got all the uh, mm -hmm. they have his wait the furniture of his waiting room they have intact, and um, they don't have the furniture of his uh, treatment room, and they you know they have pictures of where the couch was and where, where the yeah. desk was and everything. And there's a, there was a lot of analysts in town in mm -hmm. Vienna. Oh, know, yeah, there was a conference. Really... Right. Yeah. And, and they're all there, and they, they, they read papers in the daytime and visit Freud's house. And, and in the evening, they get drunk and hang out in the city, you know. And you can always tell yeah. Freudian analysts when they get drunk, you know, because they, they're always singing, I want a gal just like the gal that married dear old dad. You know? <laughs> <laughs> distinguishes them from any other school of treatment. I never realized what a, what a neurotic song that was. Oh, they were all there, you know, really just en masse. Yeah. I, I am now in my 13th year with a Freudian analyst. Oh, can we talk about that when we come back? Uh, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> Obviously need a 14th year then. We, uh, we, maybe we will. Let's okay, leave we'll it that way. We'll leave it open. We have a message we'll leave it. Sorry, with Woody Allen, we were, we were sort of segueing into the subject of... Uh, what, what is it, 15 years? In no, 13 years. Thir 13 years in, uh, in classical Freudian psychoanalysis. <clears throat> uh, yes, eight years I was on a couch, and um, five years I was allowed to sit up and face him and, and uh -huh. chat. And yeah. uh, 
it helped me, I think. I don't know. How, how do you know, really? That's what it's always the big question mark for me is when do you decide I'm done? Ah, uh, that's a good point. I don't know if you're ever really done. I know that certain characteristics about me are different now than they were when I started analysis. I'm, I started when I was uh, 22 and I'm 35. So I have age. That's something. Uh, that is progress because yes. it's upward. Yes. Um, yeah. Uh, and I can, uh, when I have sexual relations with someone, I can now think of that person. Rather than? Rather than somebody else which is an enormous step forward to me. How, how many years did that take? Where did that come in, roughly? That just came in last week. Oh. <laughs> did, can you give any pointers to that thing people always want the answer to, is how do you decide who's the right analyst for you? Did you dismiss or interview any and then, and then reject them? You know, to... uh, not me, because I always have blind faith in doctors. You know what I mean? They could do anything they want to me, and I wouldn't know the difference. I, you know, yeah. if a guy's a doctor, I go in, and, and um, whatever he says is okay with me. You know? I have no expertise, medical expertise at all. So you know, whatever they say is fine, and I, I always accept the first of anything. Of course, that's true in, in all walks with me. When I go to buy a jacket, sure. I buy the first sport jacket, the first automobile, the first, you know, I don't have the patience or the, um, the curiosity to find out anything. And you figure the guy knows what he's talking about, even though it isn't necessarily true. Yes, until Especially. he was arrested. <laughs> yes. Then did, I began to suspect something. Did you, did, did, did you have, um, have you had two analysts? Didn't you switch in mid, midstream or something? I sw yeah, I switched after eight years. I had one for eight years, and uh, I just used to lay there and and talk, and nothing really happened except, you know, that was it. So how do you decide to switch then? Why, 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 isn't well, that dangerous to switch? In why not switch? Yeah, that's true. You know what I mean? There's another way of looking at it. If, I mean, if nothing's happening, mm -hmm. I had nothing to lose by yeah. switching. So I switched, and, and now nothing's happening uh, over five years. But at least it's a different person. Yes. Would you ever let a woman psychoanalyze you? Uh, I would, but I think I'd feel shy to tell her yeah. the real innermost workings of my uh, erotic desires. And uh, how do you then? Because that's part of what you have to do in, in psychoanalysis, and there are women psychoanalysts. Right. I don't know if I could do it. I don't think I could be checked by a, women, a woman uh, MD in general. If I mm -hmm. had to be examined for regular physical by a woman, I don't yeah. think I could do it because I'm ticklish. Do, <laughs> do you ever have a fantasy that the psychoanalyst will wig out himself and send a type transcript of everything you've ever said to 50 or 100 newspapers and prominent people around the world before they catch him? Uh, <laughs> uh, or I not? Uh, no, I, I never, I I never think that. that. I, just, I think that they're, that they're not interested in me. That's, mm -hmm. that's what I always think. When I'm there talking about my problems and such, I always think that the, the, the doctor is listening to me but not really caring. He's thinking about when he can get out on a sailboat and how fast the session's going to be over mm -hmm. and, and uh, do I know a lot of good girls because I'm in show business and can I get them one? You know, that kind of thing. But no, I, I don't feel that there's any sense of, of real interest in my problems. Can you talk about that with him and not offend him? No, I try not to give him any accurate information about myself. <laughs> Do you have a fantasy life going? Uh, uh, do you still fantasize? Uh, yeah. I, that's supposed to be important for a second. I do. I, have a, I exist, I would say, more happily in my fantasy life than I do in the real world. Because I can imagine anything I want in fantasy, and, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a pleasure. Yeah. That we have a clip from your film, which involves a fantasy, actually, doesn't it? I, in fact, it's very from, from appropriate bananas, right yes. here. From Bananas. Right. Yeah. What should we know about this before we see it? Uh, that's just me on my analyst's couch in bananas, uh, mm. just chatting with her. Okay. You don't have to know anything. Let's take a look at that. I don't know, I was a nervous child. I was a bedwetter when I was younger. I, I uh, used to sleep with an electric blanket, and I was constantly electrocuting myself. <laughs> and I had this dream that I, I've had since I was a child. I had it again one night last week where I'm... Uh,
take a station break, and we will be right back after that. Oh, Woody. <laughs> that was Jack Benny. Yeah, it was good. It was real good. Yeah. Uh, you are a dropout. I didn't mean to emphasize that too much in the monologue there, but uh, you dropped out twice, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah I was thrown out. I was th th thrown out of... Um, there was a piece of stuff on my shoe. Oh. Um, <laughs> I, I was um, thrown out of NYU, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I went to City College shortly afterward because my parents were crushed that I was thrown out of NYU because I failed my major. You know, I was a, a motion picture production major at NYU, which was a really easy course where you just have to see movies and such and mm -hmm. stuff and um, and I failed it I, I um, how do you fail that you don't look at the movies when you show them you mean you sat there with yeah yeah you face <laughs> away from the screen and, um, so they threw me yeah. out and then I went to City College and I got into their film production mm -hmm. um, course and and uh, I didn't like it and they were not crazy about me and um, so they threw me out they, you so know. that's twice you so it's twice yeah, yeah. I, I uh, there are rumors of people who know you that you have a terrifically high IQ, and members of my staff who were curious to probe that uh, put together from actual intelligence, general knowledge tests, a sort of quiz for you. Would you play that? You don't have to if you don't want it. Uh, it it, will it embarrass me? No, no. It yeah. just tests your general knowledge. Oh, well, if it won't embarrass me, I'd rather not do it. <laughs> How many years in analysis? Right, let me see. It, it, we'll, we'll just go right into this. And you as just, long as it has nothing to do with putting together blocks or, or no, stuff No, and it's like not that. spatial relations. Ah, what are spatial relations? Uh, it's what astronauts have together in a capsule. I don't know what it is. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Do you ever hate having been a gag writer? No, that was a good joke. That was like, a real oh, good was joke. it? Yeah, oh. yeah. You could have delivered it with more polish, but it was a good joke. <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> All right, uh, question. How many teeth in a normal human being, and what are they? Uh, an upper and a lower. Um, mm -hmm. How many teeth in a normal human being? There's yeah. th uh, 30, uh, there's, on the top there are 32 teeth, on the bottom there are 26. There are, <laughs> this is true, there are four molars, there is a wisdom tooth, there mm -hmm. are, uh, uh, there's an incisor, and there are tw about 18 or 20 cavities. <laughs> <laughs> That's right in all, in all but uh, one thing. Uh, and what, what is the opposite of that? What actually. is the answer? No, to there that? are 32 teeth, but they're evenly distributed about the mouth, and there are eight incisors, four canines, eight premolars, and 12 molars. Ah, I have never dated a girl with 32 teeth in my life <laughs> at any time, and they were distributed in my arm, not in my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> that brings us quite nicely to the next question, which is if you were suffering, if you were suffering from a morbid fear or horror of unreasoning dread of smothering, would you be suffering? <laughs> <laughs> you hit it right on the head. That's just what I fear. It is? Yeah, I don't want to be smothered, and not by a fat woman. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that fear, are you suffering from gametophobia, agoraphobia, nigerophobia, or ketophobia? Uh, I'm suffering from flabophobia. <laughs> I don't, uh, fear of being smothered would be, um, say them again, which phobias are they? Gametophobia, agoraphobia, nigerophobia, or nigerophobia, depending on which side of the, uh, and, uh, ketophobia. Yes. Ketophobia, you'd say? I think you could take your choice of any of those phobias and, um, <laughs> put me down for one of them. <laughs> all right, all right. Actually, C, panigraphobia. Panigra? Is, is the correct answer. Fear that you will not get air when you need it? Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Yeah. I have that fear that someone will come into my bedroom put a little rubber tube through my window and suck the air out through it. <laughs> what do you bet? Oh, chances of that are happening are very, very slim. Several famous writers have used pen names. Is Charles L. Dogson the real name of Agatha Christie, Franz Kafka, Mickey Spillane, or Lewis Carroll? Ah, uh, none of the above. <laughs> the answer is feathers. <laughs> Ah, you have passed the most difficult part of the test. Which, which one is that? I'm curious. It's actually own... Lewis Carroll's name. Lewis Carroll's name was actually what? Uh, it was actually Charles L. Dogson. So why did he change it? To Jewish, right? <laughs> I don't know why. It doesn't give that. Very strange Can man. You, uh, uh, this is, uh, the, in, the British in India invented a game called Pune. Ah, I played it. Well, then good, because the question is, <laughs> is the game still played? Uh, and, and if so, how? Uh, it requires two consel consenting adults to play the game. <laughs> and one is the Puna and one is the Puni. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if we need to go on with this or not. You spin a dial <laughs> and you can advance two squares if you like. And you have to yell out, Puni, Puni. Uh, 
and then they give you paper money, or script, as it's called, and then you smear butter on the person you're playing with and recite the word nutmeg seven times. <laughs> That's uncanny. Yes. First one to reach the the punitorium is the winner. <laughs> That's um, close enough to the correct answer that I... I I'm going to give you a hundred on that. Um, what is the Bernoulli effect in, uh, in, in science? The Bernoulli, the Bernoulli effect? The Bernoulli effect. A body falling through space uh, can cripple you if it hits you. <laughs> That's, uh, <laughs> that's amazingly close. The correct answer is the decrease in pressure as the velocity of a fluid increases. Yes, which, it, it, it is also that, but only in Latin countries. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Had you known the correct answer, might have helped your first marriage. Let's see. What's Boyle's Law? Answer. Oh, do I don't want to read the answer. Boyle's Law. That's a good one. Boyle's Law uh, yeah. has got to do with the skin. Yes. If, if a person develops an excrescence on their skin in a post-adolescent uh, age, it mm -hmm. is called a boil or Boyle's Law or um, a monstrous hickey of some sort. Um, and um, Boyle himself will come over the house and lance it for you. Boyle will come yes, over? Yes, yes, he will. He makes house calls. Um, <laughs> And, and uh, it's used as a, as a uh, blanket to, to wrap uh, Indian presence in by the, by the, the uh, um, uh, old Navajo Indians who are, uh, can be found I I mostly in, in nautical ships and things at sea. And stop me before I make I, a fool I, I have to. I, we've set intelligence tests back a, a decade. After this message of interest, we'll be right back. Talking with Woody Allen, who just passed the intelligence test with flying colors. Do, do, you, uh, do you still have trouble with mechanical things? You uh, said you didn't want to do a spatial test or anything. Yeah, I have trouble with mechanical like things. I've always had trouble with them. I have the latest thing that happened to me, but it was not quite so recently. Uh, I have a remote control television set. And, uh, you know, you turn it on with that little button. And uh, I left the house. This was some time ago now. I went to see a film, turned the set off. I went to see, actually what I went to see was a pornographic film in the Broadway area called Harlot. I don't know if you saw that or not, no, but I was moved not to watch the Partridge family, but to watch Harlot. <laughs> and I go out of my house, filthy picture incidentally, it absolutely fulfills your fondest expectations. <laughs> really dirty, the, the projectionist had the film in upside down and no one could tell the difference. <laughs> you know? Kidding. And while I'm out, the telephone in my house, when it rings, it turns on the television set, you know, because oh. the, the frequency is the same. It mm -hmm. works on sound. That's possible. So I come back to my house. I didn't know the set is on. The phone had rung. And I go up, and I'm walking down the hall to my bedroom, and I hear, when he comes in, we'll chop him up in little pieces and put him in the chair. <laughs> so I get scared, you know, because yeah. I'm, I, you know, I'm fairly cowardly. And um, I back quietly, I don't go in the room because I've really got good reflexes, I go into the hall closet and pull it closed, you know, yeah. while adrenaline is coming out of my ears, you know, <laughs> like this. And I stand there frozen like this and I hear them talking and talking and I wait and I wait and it goes on and on and then I realized I couldn't believe, the only reason that I came out later was that I couldn't believe that guys would rob my bedroom and then sing the Star Spangled Banner, you know? <laughs> You, uh, well, one who has so much trouble with mechanical things, you, you do know how to put a clarinet together, I noticed. Have you noticed how I've brought everything together here? Yes. Because that's a bond. You're that probably going to ask me to play something now. Well, I might. I... And because I anticipated that, I brought my clarinet, and we've locked the doors from the outside. Um, so where is it? It's uh, not uh, here. That's, oh, oh here. here it is. You see, I can play it. I can't find it. That's the problem. I have it. And if you continue chatting with me, I'm going to assemble my clarinet and favor you with an air. Oh, that'd be swell. <laughs> so don't, don't get too hysterical because um, I'm not that good. I have a feeling for jazz because, uh, uh, because it's a black contribution to our culture. And as you know, I am mulatto. <laughs> I did That's not true. know that. You know, I've known you for... Yes? What have I known you for? Seven years and yes. didn't know that? My mother is black and my father is white and vice versa. <laughs> I like a man who's willing to... Do you grease your corks? No, just my hair. No, no, I mean... 
The corks on the parts of the clarinet. That oh, yeah, sure. I put all sorts of chiz all over them so I can put Bear grease, together. I think, they, is yes. the best thing for them. Yes. No. Uh, yeah, good. <laughs> I got a great sound. Um, can you give me a mood light or something, you know, the, <laughs> as, as though I was actually a musician? And try not to laugh when I play this, because uh, I take it very seriously. The blue spotlight would be nice. It's only the first line. My next selection. Wait, wait, you, 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 uh, you, you killed a snake in the Bronx <laughs> Zoo, I think. Right? We, we will be right back after this message. I sound good interest. today. Mr. Allen has many moods at the clarinet. Yeah. And you heard one of them, and we have no, assembled it. No, there was two it. of them. Oh, there were two of the yeah. moods. Well, well, they were dynamic, and we have assembled at tremendous uh, expense a number of... Uh, yeah, I'm going to actually play. Um, if you can take that, you think. Uh, what I'm going to do, though, is if yeah. you'll permit me, with your kind permission, can I take my jacket off? Oh, I'm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Need help? Here, I'll hold yeah, that. Would you hold it? I know how to hold it. Yeah, and don't hurt it, because it, right. it affirms my Freudian totality. <laughs> First Should thing be, I noticed. Yeah, playing the harmonica. Um, okay, okay, we'll, we'll see you in just a yeah. moment. Uh, okay, uh, talk to me while I go up there, because I'm scared. He's, uh, he really is quite concerned about his serious playing, and uh, play. here, in fact, is a sample of it. Uh, are we in two? And, and uh, yeah. Okay, can you make that? Do you want me to get that? Okay, be nice.
Oh, we're back. Um, talking with Woody. Um, gee, the, the various clarinet moods that you have are amazing. It's really wonderful. Yes, I went uh, from amusing to hilarious. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> but when, when, you're, um, when you're directing a film like you've been doing lately, is it, is it bad while you're directing a film to go see other people's movies? <clears throat> bad for me. I is it? don't see many movies as yeah. a rule because uh, I don't see contemporary comedies as a rule. I see um, pictures that can't influence me very much. I saw the last picture I saw actually uh, was the Hellstrom Chronicle, which is a good oh, yeah. picture. I don't know if you saw it or not. The insect picture. picture. Yeah, yeah, and uh, they sh <laughs> they showed two spiders <laughs> making love in the picture, and. Um, they, the, the narrator said that uh, amongst insects, um, the, you know, the only important thing is that the female, doesn't matter what she's like, as long as she's of the same species. Uh -huh. And that interested me because those are my standards. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and so it was yes. really fascinating. You identified with the bugs. Immediately, uh, yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you can't escape identifying if you go to the movies, I think, no matter what it is. I thought I would be safe in that picture. Mm -hmm. I avoid all comedies that can, that can uh, influence me. And, um, and as, as a consequence, my pictures are unlike anyone else's pictures. And I don't know if that's, uh, some of it's good and some of it's not so good. Because uh, yeah. uh, I wish, uh, I'm glad they're unusual pictures. Uh, I wish I could get my feet more rooted in reality to some degree, because uh, I think I could probably make even better films, even better. Um, I think I could make passable films if, um, <laughs> you know, if I did that. Don't have to be modest. It is, that is interesting that it, when you're working on something, you don't, I've heard that said in other media, writers that don't, who write, who are writing a novel, don't dare read other novels. Uh, songwriters right. won't, can't listen to other music. And yet there are those who, who do, who, th who are afraid that they're going to not be hip to something that's going on. And, um, I think if, if, your, if your work comes from inside your own head a lot, you know what I mean? Like someone, I'm thinking of Fellini, whose yeah. images on the screen and whose projects are enormously um, uh, personal that you don't have to see anybody else or do anything else or you know you could you could, he could just sit in his room and never go out and make those same pictures because mm -hmm. all those bizarre things and the same thing with me I could sit in my room and never go out and probably make take the money and run or bananas um, because they're you know there's not that much they're not the humor is not rooted in it's surrealistic mm -hmm. you, but would you like to make a comedy that was completely non surrealistic then something like uh where everything in it could actually happen, and uh, like it happened one night, or some of the old classic comic films like that. Uh, where, gee, you know, I don't know. I might want to do that. What you meant when you said fun. more based in reality? Yeah, I, as it turns out, my, the projects that I'm working on now, I'm, I'm going to appear in uh, the film version of my play, Play It Again, Sam. Uh, Paramount's mm -hmm. making it into a movie, and I'm not directing it or anything, but I will be appearing in it. Uh, you know, it will require about eight weeks of acting. Um, and, but that, that I would not consider my movie. That's just an mm -hmm. acting job. But um, following that, in December, I'm going to go into production with a film that I wrote and will be starring in and directing, starring in with other people, and directing uh, based on um, Dr. Rubin's book, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Sex But Were Afraid to Ask. And um, I've written a script that can only be described as Rabelaisian. And, um, what would be another word for it? Uh, trashy. Uh -huh. uh, and it's, um, it's an exploration of the ins and outs, every little nook and cranny of our sexual um, motivations and interests and uh, graphically illustrated. It would be um, sexual relations if the Marx Brothers were doing them. Oh, that should be hilarious. Yeah, it's very do you, personal. Do you get a pressure ever to, because you can write, uh, not to waste your time on anything else. I mean, writing is generally taken to be the most serious talent a person can have. And if a person can write as you can, um, seriously if you want to, or funny if you want to, do you ever get this pressure of why, should, why do you fool around with movies or music or any of that from other people? Or even from yourself? You yeah, you, 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 you should you just it, write? Well, you do it because uh, you get away from writing. It's real tough to write. Because yeah. when, when I wake up in the morning and I have to write something, I have to lock myself in the room, in my office or my bedroom or wherever it is I like to write. I like to lie in the bed and write, that, yeah. now you know, um, and with a pencil. Yeah. And um, you do it alone, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and uh, the maid will slip a sandwich in at about 12.30 in the afternoon, you know what I mean? And that's the sum total of my social activity when I write. 
And, is, but when I do a movie, I get a chance to, or a play, I get a chance to meet people and I can cast and attractive women come in and audition and I, and I meet camera people and look through mm -hmm. cameras and travel and, you know, it's real depressing. What can you make the most perfect? This is sort of a dumb question, but I mean... It, a blonde. No, 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 I don't mean in that, I meant in that area. I mean, I always have a thing when I see something that I think is perfect, like a, a Bergman film or a, a short story by Gene Stafford, or, mm -hmm. you know, it can be in any field. Something that's just, they, the, the person just got it perfect, and it's a frustration that I have, because I don't get, there's no way in this mixed up kind of job that mm -hmm. I do to ever feel like you've actually had the time to work out anything just the way you want it, every frame of a film being perfect, every word of a short story or whatever. Right. Do you get that more in writing than you do in making you get a film? It, well, I, I go for it more in writing. And uh, See, I like my movies to be sloppy. If you've seen Take the Money and Run and Bananas, mm -hmm. I like them to look real sloppy, you know, where nothing matches and jokes come in from left field and, and um, you know, where it, it should look like a rough chair instead of a nice Louis XIV chair. You know, I mean, I want it to look real sloppy is what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas when you write something, if I write something for the New Yorker or for a magazine, um, you want it to be perfect. And it's easier to make it perfect because it's so small. You know, you can yeah. just cuddle it yeah. and fondle it until it becomes sweet. Is it, do you ever get into this kind of argument of whether the movies are an art or not? Do you think that a, a masterpiece by Bergman can be compared to a masterpiece by Picasso and then that kind of uh, boring yeah. argument. Yeah, I do get into those boring arguments, and yeah. and uh, yes, I do think it though. I do think that films are an art, and that there are a few films that are really artistic and and rank with the greatest masterpieces in any other art form. What would be three of those? You really want to know? Yeah. Uh, the Seventh Seal, yeah. by Ingmar Bergman, I would say is a a great picture, a great artistic picture. Um, I think La Ventura, mm -hmm. by uh, Antonioni. Is a great picture, and um, there's one Andy Hardy film that. Um, <laughs> uh, I asked Orson Welles that question. Grand Illusion was, a great was one. Film. Grand Illusion was a great film. Yeah. yeah. When I asked Wells that, he named two movies, one of which was Grand Illusion, and he named another one, and then we were rushed. He knew that the camera that was going to go commercial, and he said, "And something else." Yeah, something else. And film buffs went out looking for this movie, something else, for weeks. Uh, they thought he, the way he said it, it came out as a title. Right. Something else, a film by Francois Truffaut. Right, yes, with uh, Claudia um, Obginale. Yes. There's a, there's a uh, bit of film that we have of one of your films now, and, and it's from, the other, from your first movie, Take the Money and Run. Right, after mentioning these great films, you know, I hate to show this. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, it, it's wry in its intent, and um, ah. it's, a, it's an interesting little f piece of film from Take the Money and Run. Okay. And that's all. Let's take it and show it. Uh, oh, what? One second? It's coming up now. Unable to fit in with any aspect of his environment, Virgil strikes out on his own. Just as a footnote to film history, where was that alley, anyway? That was behind the Hungry Eye in San Francisco. I thought so. I know that alley. Do you? Yes, I used to go there after my act, uh, when I was peer appearing at the Hungry Eye. I would go there and meet the audience, and we would both be sick occasionally. It was really, I, right. I, I recognize That's that. That's where it is. We, we shot Take the Money and Run in San Francisco. This was some years ago now. Yeah. And we had to make, we had to find a city that would look like seven different places in the United States, none of which were San Francisco, because the movie takes place in New Jersey, Indiana, mm -hmm. down south, uh, New York. And San Francisco, if you shoot it judiciously, 
uh, and hit the right parts of town. You can make it look like almost any place in the United States. That's good to know if you're making a film. After this message, we will be right back. We're talking about your writing, and uh, this is something I've always wished they would do, whoever <laughs> they are, is put all your uh, New Yorker pieces into a book. And uh, this is just, is it come out? Just, uh, well, yes, uh, it, no, October yeah, sure. 15th is the, uh, was with the publication <laughs> date. <laughs> is or was the publication yeah, date. I'm disoriented. Yeah, it's called Getting Even. And these are all, a, are, are there any exceptions in here? I mean, are all these things that appeared in the New Yorker, or are there no, some that never did? No, there are some that never did. Uh, I, can I see it for a second? Yeah. No, I just want to check it out. It's my face on the cover, in case you, you don't know. It's, a, uh, it's also on the back cover. <laughs> it looks a little like the seventh seal, that face, uh, somehow. That's right, of, because uh, I have a good, tragic face. I should not mm -hmm. be doing comedy. I should be doing Swedish tragedy, you know? <laughs> Well, the hell with it. Um, this is, uh, this contains uh, all my pieces from the New Yorker magazine to date, plus several other uh, published things yeah. uh, in other magazines, and a few new things that I wrote just for this book. There's about a dozen from the New Yorker and a couple from some other magazines, and, and I wrote a couple just so they would buy the book if they've read them all, anyhow. Yeah, they're really hilarious. I read, I think, oh, four-fifths of it last night. And there's one, I know there was one that I hadn't seen anywhere uh, called Mr. Big. That's Is right. It? That's right. That, that was written just for this book. Yeah, really funny. Oh, um, but it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, book. yeah, you can get there's this at your bookstore. There's so few uh, funny books that are actually funny. I know it's easily said, but the junk that they sell for humor, I think of the poor people in hospitals who get these cruddy little books that are supposed to make them laugh, and they never do. Or right, people they, who aren't in hospitals, but... Yeah, because I don't Awful. know why, uh, humor, but writing comedy humor. is a weird talent, and there's not too many people that really have it, you know, yeah. to, to, to be able to, to write comedy. And I don't know what, you know, it doesn't mean that you're good in anything or intelligent or anything. It's just some freak kind of mutation that you can write things uh -huh. and they come out funny. Yeah. Um, S.J. Perlman, of course, who's uh, miraculous at it, is miraculous at it, Robert Benchley. Mm -hmm. um, and there are a couple of other people that... Are, that um, you know, that are tremendous at it. And, uh, you know, I'm thinking of Frank Sullivan and, uh, and mm. uh, Max Schulman and, and uh, you know, where they have a real pro style that's funny. But most people um, don't write such funny stuff. I don't know why. Who do you read when you, want, when you don't want to laugh, but when you just want to read something good, Me? good writing? Yeah. Uh, I'm a heavy reader. I, yeah. I read, uh, um, I don't like reading. You know, because I think uh, I think reading is a secondary experience, and that if you can be doing anything else and you're reading, it's a mistake. You know, so I read exclusively when I get into bed at night. That's uh, that's what. <laughs> Why? Because you think that that's my only choice, right? <laughs> No, I, I, that's when I read, because I get tired. You know, I read, uh, and my eyes get tired, and then I drop off to dreamland. And um, I read Kafka a lot. I'm a big fan of his. And uh, I read a lot of philosophy. You'll notice there's a lot of philosophy in here. And I mean, a lot of death. A lot of death. I like to write about death a lot, because it, it, um, I'm obsessed with death, you know, as I was saying earlier in the yeah. show, when we died. And... Um, <laughs> You know, I, Where does that come from? Does that run in your family, a morbid streak? I think I have it, too. You, you do think about it a lot? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah we just upset somebody in the band. With, uh... yeah, you, you can't mention the subject without... Do you ever have the feeling that... Uh, that this has nothing to do with that, really. Mm -hmm. But do you ever... You know, we're sitting here talking now, not unlike we might in real life. Right. Do you ever get the strange feeling when you're on television that maybe, actually, this is the night when the odds tipped to the extreme end of improbability, and not one person is watching. All the time. I think that all the time. Yeah. I am notorious for getting low ratings on television. You know, I did two specials, the first one years ago, got a real low rating. The last special I did was on CBS. I, it was me, uh, Billy Graham, Candy Spurgeon, and The Fifth Dimension, and myself. And this was about two years ago now. I was on opposite. On, I was on CBS. On ABC, there was a movie that got a higher rating on me. On NBC, there was a card that said, "Please stand by. We will, you know, <laughs> be back in a minute." That got a higher rating than my show. And it wasn't even a moving card. Just Not a... even a moving card. Just transmission interrupted. We'll be back in a little while. And people were watching that and not watching my show. Now, what do you? You must have an explanation for that because uh, you're a tremendous success in all the media. But I don't know why exactly. You know, I'm not being facetious, but my television shows do get 
uh, have gotten low ratings. Wait, you'll see in your two weeks of, of 90 minute shows with people, see if I don't get a lower rating than, you know, I don't know who you're doing them with, but, but you'll see. Really, you'll be the bottom. I will this. be the rock bottom rating that you get. In other words, it is quite possible that there's no one watching now, or just a handful of people. A handful of perverts are watching the show at this moment. Um, I think that I'm a specialized taste. I'm a, mm. like a rare wine that a person must be uh, have a certain amount of education, a certain amount of breeding, as it were. Um, <laughs> they, uh, yes, that's yes, true. Yes, it's true. Of course, um, I didn't mean to laugh. I don't know what got into me. Of course. <clears throat> uh, so you're not going to get many normals watching this show, um, <laughs> really. Yes, we have quite a perverted audience actually in the studio. I don't yeah, know you they, get great-looking girls in the audience. We cleaned out the bus station when. You know uh, that? Yeah. What, what, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, go ahead. Well, what do you mean? Uh, I, I say this people at uh, uh, the bus station is you probably empty. You get a great empty. many great girls in the bus oh, station. Oh, sorry, I did it again, didn't <laughs> yeah. I? Uh, you got great girls. Yeah, bus station. Uh, yeah. <laughs> could you split so the screen anyhow, and we could talk about it? Um, I was just remarking uh, uh, that every time I've done this show, which has been like three times, mm -hmm. um, you get real pretty girls in the audience, and I, it's a consistent thing, and I don't know exactly why you do. Oh, I get much prettier ones on the nights you're not here. <laughs> oh, I, do, do you? I've heard you. <laughs> because no, I, uh, it is funny. Uh, you know what it is? I think that a number of... Uh, I know why you think that. Um, airline stewardesses uh, often uh, attend the uh, television broadcast, and you'll probably find that a number of these people now uh, are airline stewardesses. Is that why there are the paper bags on the chairs in front of you? Uh, <laughs> Possibly good. not. You know, Possibly I've done the Tonight not. Show and the, uh, many yeah. times in the uh, Merck Griffin Show and the David Frost Show, and, and they, they get attractive women, but you get consistently good girls yeah. here, and I, you know, I'm, it, it's maybe worth hanging out outside. <laughs> <laughs> you could come here and get a job pushing something. Uh, That's some right. Time. I could hang out here, yeah. but it means I'd have to leave the schoolyard. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back after this message from our local station. I'm talking about Talking with Woody, you've, you've done a number of comic routines where, uh, you, where you've been in fights and, and things, and I'm not asking you to lead into a comic <laughs> piece of material, but have you ever actually been in a fight where you were punched very hard or where you hit somebody else very hard as a kid? I've been punched hard. I, yeah. I, uh, I was, my nose was broken in a fight when I was about 13 years old, and it's, um, it has a, you can't see it so well, but you could feel it if you came up here. I got a big bump in my nose up yeah. here because he uh, the kid we were fighting about um, uh, we we're playing football and we were fighting about where the ball should be placed like on the 20 yard line or the 30 yard line and mm -hmm. I was in favor of the 20 and the 30s won <laughs> <laughs> and um, we had a disagreement an altercation and uh, we exchanged viewpoints mm -hmm. and uh, he smashed me in the nose with his fist and flattened my nose against my face completely you know it was real Real good smack in the uh, nose. Jeez. And um, I went to the hospital, and they, um, they popped it out for me. They got it back out. Yeah. You know, it's the truth. There was, you know, and to this day, there's, there's a yeah. bump in my nose. You mean the actual, the, all the cartilage was just smashed flat against flat the against face? Flat against my face. I really, I looked like Brando, you know? Yeah. It's just, just hung down like that. It's like no nose at all. I could put my undershirt on easily. You know? <laughs> The facts in this story are true, although there are people who think you, you've made that. No, I'm not kidding. That, you know, it's funny, I can never tell a story <laughs> and people think that, that I'm always kidding around. Last time you were on, you told that story about the lady whose terrace you live above and, and how some rubber snakes that you had to frighten pigeons fell down on the terrace and frightened the old lady. And people thought that was such an original routine, whereas in fact... I, I, yeah, it actually, actually happened. Yeah. And it, it, it happens to you all the time. When I came out here before to play the clarinet, I was serious, you know, and I started to play and then everybody laughs because they think I'm kidding. <laughs> So then my natural comic instincts go with it. <laughs> yeah, and and I turn it into a masterpiece of comic satire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's what happens to me. Every time I try and do something uh, serious, people, people laugh at me, which would be a problem if I tried to do a serious movie ever. You know, and I would like to do right. one sometime. Yeah. I'd like to make a movie where I was real serious in it. And, uh, but I have a feeling that people would come in, and as soon as they saw me on the screen, mm -hmm. they would start to laugh. Yeah. Unless I made a comedy and wanted them to laugh. Then in they which would case? come in and then get that wave of apathy from the yeah, audience. Yeah. Uh, do, do your relatives find you amusing? Your mother and father, your grandfather. Do you have grandparents living? Uh, yes, yeah. I have. Uh, no, not living. Oh, <laughs> not living. No. no. You know, it's funny because I have this picture of him, but yeah. no, he's not living. Uh, uh, but uh, he, wa he was living at one time. Your grandfather. <laughs> yeah. Do you and remember him clearly? 
I remember him because uh, of an incident that occurred before he died. Do I have a minute to tell this? Sure. Yeah. Uh, my grandfather lived in New York and was, uh, you know, quite old when he died. And uh, he, when in his older age, he bought an insurance policy, which is difficult to get when you're older. And the guys, this fly-by-night company that sent, sold him the policy, you know, it was a real sucker policy. I mean, it was just real, a real fake company. And so he was, one day he was on Central Park West, he was over at the, um, met, the uh, Museum of Natural History, and he was standing down there in the rotunda. And I don't know if you know this or not, but at the Museum of Natural History, there's an enormous stuffed whale on chains hanging from the ceiling. You know, they have natural exhibitions. So the chain broke, the whale fell, and hit him. So he put in for insurance. And he claimed that he was hit by a falling whale <laughs> on 81st Street and Central Park West. And it turns out that's the one thing he's covered for. <laughs> And let it charmed life. Yeah, he's 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 not with us any longer. Yeah, but your parents uh, they find you funny, I expect. My parents, uh, all right, so so. You know, yeah. they don't. I don't kill them. I mean, they're not my biggest fans. Yeah, they can take me in small doses. I <laughs> see. We haven't discussed any of the major issues of our time, uh, which is maybe just as well. And all. Do you have any thoughts? On, and I'll pick one out of the air at random. Do you, what about the the constantly raging argument about legalizing marijuana? Legalizing marijuana, I, uh, I'm for its legalization, but I'm against its use because I don't like anything uh, like cigarettes or alcohol or marijuana. I have gotten high. Uh, I tried to get high. Actually, it didn't work. I was with a girl. This was years ago, and uh, I was ashamed not to take the marijuana because she had it, and uh, I wanted to impress her with my casual manner. So I started smoking with her, and nothing at all happened to me. I got no message out of it or no buzz. The dog that was in the room at the time started laughing. Amazing. Yeah. I mentioned in a Playboy interview that you don't use any stimulants or drink or anything like right. that. People thought that was a joke. I don't know why they picture you as somebody who would take odd things. I know. I, uh, uh, it's funny, because yeah. I don't. I, I don't get high. I don't drink ever really and I don't smoke cigarettes or you know eat bad foods if I can avoid it actually you know because I, I like to take care of my body because you only have one body or or two and and, um, <laughs> and I you know I don't want to you know I don't want to do anything that's bad for me and yours is one of the wonders of the, of the modern age yes I uh, thank you You're welcome we have a message from my local stations we'll be back there it is. We've been caught. Were we saying anything uh, unprintable? I hope not. No. But th this has been this has been fun. Thank you for coming. Oh, it was a pleasure. Giving us this section of your life, this I'm slice do of your life. I'm going to 90 minutes on uh, the CBS show 60 Minutes in a little while. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to Are you going to talk extremely fast? Yes. Uh, I'm yes. Well, well uh, if there's anything left over, bring it over here, and we'll use it. And thank you for being here, oh, Mr. Yeah. A, and we'll see you tomorrow thank night. You. night. Thank you. Thank you.